Um, special thanks to my team, Mark and Pete, for um, getting busy slashing and whippersnipping and stuff. So place looks pretty good. So great job, guys. Really well done. Um, wouldn't be able to do it without them. So um, what I wanted to do um, today was basically just to highlight a bit of work that we're moving into. Um, methane, um, emissions, carbon, they're all sort of hot topics at the moment. New South Wales DPI um, are investing in this area as well. Very con we're, um, we're interested in finding out more information so that we can be um, on the front foot, I suppose, to be able to, to assist um, with um, whichever way things go in the future. So this is, um, so DPI have got a number of different projects. Um, this is one um, project that we've, that are in part of this um, particular program. Now, um, so if you, Aaron is going to be talking um, more generally about all of this uh, later on. I don't need that, do I? Do I still need that? Yeah, you need it. The, um, Aaron's going to be talking more generally um, about, or big picture type things, and I guess we're, I guess the rest of us were just to add little bits of detail that we're, that we're doing um, in this space. So um, just as sort of without stealing his thunder, and I certainly won't be giving the whole story, but um, agriculture makes up about 15% of greenhouse gas emissions in New South Wales, so 15%. And of that, about 75% of that is produced by our, by our livestock, by our ruminants. So this is sort of why I guess um, agriculture is becoming very much um, under the spotlight and why we're, why we're working in this space. Now methane is, you know, it's a natural product of rumen fermentation. So it's sort of not something we can exactly sort of stop, put a plug in it, so to speak. Um, but there are a range of different strategies um, that you can be, can be employed, I suppose, to actually minimise that, um, which is, I guess, the focus today. We'll be addressing some of those. So, um, you know, without going into any detail, you can look at genetics and certainly not being, having a comprehensive list, but you know, there's genetics. Um, you can look at um, feeding asparagopsis. I don't, you've probably he heard some of that in the media. It's the seaweed, which they've um, been able to turn into a, um, sort of like a supplement or, a, or an additive. Now that's great for, um, for intensive systems, but it's not as effective on extensive systems like, like we have. So for us, maybe the most cost effective method for us to be able to, to reduce some of these emissions is to be looking at high quality pastures, which have, um, which contain species, which have some anti-methanogenic potential. So high quality means that it's actually moving through the rumen quickly. So it means that we're not producing, it's not sitting in the rumen for long. So it's, we're minimizing the amount of um, methane that's being produced but we're also maximising our live weight gains. So it means that our livestock are getting, are moving off, off farm as quick as possible. When it actually comes to anti-methanogenic species, the, um, the, what makes them anti-methanogenic are, are compounds called secondary metabolites. Now we're actually working with um, plant chemists um, with this to be able to start to sort of tease out which which metabolites are working for us. So there's tannins, um, con condensed tannins, which you've probably heard of, um, also saponins. So to understand what they are, <coughs> excuse me, what they are, <coughs> and also what proportion they are in different species. So if we can actually incorporate these into our mixes, then we've got a better chance of actually having, um, reducing the methane that we're producing. Now, the, um, we actually, so there's a number of benefits of, of these uh, secondary metabolites. So we've got that reduced methane. Other additional benefits which are reported are um, increasing live weight production, so meat production, also wool, in addition to, um, to milk production. So there's, you know, there's, there's a number, number of advantages. Um, also increased fertility is reported um, with, um, with some of these species or with um, the condensed tannins or these secondary metabolites. One of the disadvantages is that they can also actually restrict intake and also the nutrient availability. So, you know, I guess in this case, we can't always have our cake and eat it. So what we, but we actually have a number of these species already available for us on the market. So just um, a few species, so Bicerula, Cerradella, uh, Chicory, Sula or Hediserum, Lotus, Forage Rate, Sainfoin, 
um, is one. It's a species that's actually it's not commercially available, but um, has sort of comes in and un, um, in and out of the spotlight over time. And also for those that like tropicals, we've also got species like Desmanthus and Lachina that also um, can, can have condensed tannins. Now, these species are all readily eaten by stock. So it means that we're actually already, you know, on step one, well on the way to be able to formulate some of these mixes. So I guess the challenge that we have within our program is to develop high quality pastures, which contain some of these species so that we can, um, we can reduce some of the methane production from them, in addition to being persistent. So that's what this experiment is here. Um, what an incredible year to be establishing a temperate pasture. Like normally a first year pasture looks good, but this one's absolutely gone berserk. So what we have here is um, uh, two species mixtures. So in each one we have a grass or herb um, in, a, in a mix with a legume. So um, we've got phalaris and chicory are our grass and our herb. Plus we've got a range of different legumes. So so that I don't forget any. We're, in this particular experiment, we've got Bicerula, arrow leaf, uh, sainfoin. If you're not familiar with sainfoin, this is it here. Uh, we've also got um, Hediserum, which is that pretty one up the end. Uh, Lucin and subclover are probably our, um, our benchmarks, I suppose, and um, our controls. And we're also well, the plan was actually to sow Desmanthus into this, um, this particular experiment, by, um, but by the look of it, I don't think Desmanthus is really going to want to come up. But, um, but we are actually planning on having some separate experiments where we, where we will be looking at um, about our tropicals as well. All right, so I guess today, really what I wanted to do was just um, raise awareness about this particular program. Um, not surprisingly, we've had phenomenal establishment. Um, so our chicory and our phalaris, you know, we established, I think every seed that went in the ground came up. So we were looking at around 130 plants per metre squared, which is huge. Our legumes, um, they were not quite as, they were more variable. So, you know, we had ranging from 37 up to, again, 130 plants per metre squared. So it's gone absolutely berserk. Um, there's a lot of production there. Um, we did an assessment um, a couple of weeks ago and, you know, we're looking at, you know, not surprising, you know, we're looking at over 10 tonne on some of these things. Now, um, some of these, so arrow leaf, clover and the heady serum are very stemmy, um, which is, um, yeah, which is the reason, you know, they're just so huge. Now, from this point on, the plan will be to, um, well, we need to let our annual legumes senesce and then we'll be starting to, um, to do more regular assessments from there. Um, we are collecting um, samples for nitrogen fixation. We're also looking at um, forage quality to see what the quality of these, um, these species are throughout the growing season over a three year period. And we're also collecting samples for our plant chemists to be able to um, have a look at the saponin and condensed tannin levels um, through the growing season um, with the different species and in these mixes. Uh, the next stage after this is going to be do some, um, some grazing studies where we'll actually pick some of the best bets out of those and put some livestock on them. Um, we're also going to be doing some methane studies. Um, now this is only one of three sites um, and different work is being done in different parts of the state. But, um, but yeah, so if you're interested in any of these um, secondary metabolites or understanding some of that, uh, Jenny Wood, Jen, can you just put your hand up please? Uh, Jenny Wood is here and if you've got any questions on those, I'm sure she'll be very happy to answer them for you. I'll just flick the phone to her very quickly. Um, but look, we've, we're actually fortunate to have um, a diverse team here um, in Tamworth to be able to be able to work with plant chemists like Jenny and her team so that we, um, you know, so that we can do all this um, here, um, addressing this issue on site with, um, yeah, with our people for our producers. The um, uh, sainfoin is one of those particular species um, which doesn't tend to um, regrow very well from, and recover very well from grazing. Chicory, in my experience, um, or in our experience before, we have um, played with chicory before. It does tend to only last, well, it looks great the first year. It doesn't tend to look as good the next year. I guess I, within this experiment, I guess we're aiming for, a lot of them are a perennial or a regenerating annual. The aim is to look for long-term persistence. But reality, I think with some of these species, we might be looking at, say, almost like short-term high-quality um, pastures, which is where something like the chicory might come in. 
Now, um, the same foin has come back on the spotlight again because it does contain condensed tannins. It does have a lot of the attributes which, um, you know, which, which are favourable within, within a system other than the fact that it doesn't tend to handle grazing very well. Um, it also has some, some rhizobia issues. So we um, dug up plants um, of this. Everything is nondulated really well, um, except for the same foin. So we're back to applying nitrogen on it just so we can see what its potential is. But, but yes, um, we would like persistence, ultimately persistence and long-term longevity out of a perennial pasture is, is the way to go. But realistically, with some of these, they might actually only be, they might be short-term, high-quality, um, high-production type pastures. Okay. No, Andrew, on this one, we're not, look, um, we're not looking at nutrient removal specifically. We are, um, so do you mean measuring the um, nutrition of the herbage or do you mean doing soil samples? Um, so we are, we are collecting samples and they will be going up and having a range of different minerals taken from them, um, um, as in analysed for. Which ones specifically I couldn't tell you off the top of my head because they were still working out quotes last time I looked for, um, for which minerals. But yes, there is, there is, we are planning on doing some of that. Um, so yeah, if you speak with me later, um, I'll, I'll be able to work out which ones specifically we are, uh, we are doing. All right, so um, the second part of work that we're doing here at Tamworth, which is part of this uh, DPI suite of uh, projects where we're looking at increasing quality and lowering, lowering methane, is um, looking at some annual uh, fodder crops. So traditionally, um, well, they're an important part of our, of our grazing system. They sow in early, provide high quality feed. We actually, if they're sowing early, then we get that nice winter production from them to be able to carry our livestock over and fill that winter feed gap. Traditionally, I guess we've sown oats. Um, I guess, um, yeah, I guess long-term oats has been our, our, um, our mainstay. More recently, I think we started looking at some of these dual purpose crops, um, brassicas and, um, and like the, the grazing, uh, the dual purpose um, cereals. But um, I guess, Overall, um, I think there is often a comment that um, animal production isn't as high as what you might anticipate on, on, a high quality, on the high quality forage that they produce. In addition to that, um, um, that there's sometimes some animal health issues associated with them. So I guess um, through time, there's been a bit more of a, um, an interest in adding mixes. So whether that just means putting something in with your canola, canola crop just to make it a little less um, safe, oh, sorry, a little more safe for your livestock or to extend your growing season, um, they're becoming more and more popular. The, uh, so, and, and I think it's actually starting to get broader than that. So it's not just a couple of species. We can actually have three, four, and there's also been some multi-species um, mixes which are available and they're becoming increasingly um, popular as well. So you've got your, you've got an increased nutritional profile from them, so higher, higher quality. They grow for longer during the growing season. The um, increased productivity, um, so actually herbage production, in, um, and then you've also got um, the follow-on from livestock to do, to do with that as well. Um, and also that diversity for the animals, so they can actually they can actually graze what they want um, as they, as they um, you know, as it grows. So coming back to you, um, who sows or recommends a, um, an annual winter forage crop? Show of hands. Vast majority, good. So that's a winter. So who sows a single species, whether that be an oats or a dual purpose? Who sows um, like mixes, it's mixes of two or more? So there's probably still the majority are sowing single species, single species crops. So this year we actually commenced a program of a project um, which is um, collaborative between DPI and Meat and Livestock Australia donor company to actually look into this a little bit um, in more detail. So um, there's a lot of um, anecdotal evidence, I suppose, out there saying that they are high quality 
better nutritional profile, um, grow longer in the growing season. So we, we actually wanted to put some numbers on that. Overseas, they're, they're looking okay, although there are mixed reports. So what are they actually doing um, for us? That there, were, there was no Australian data. So um, this is one of three sites which has been conducted across the state. Um, there's another, another experiment up at Glen Innes and the third one is down around the Wagga area. So we are, we've actually got um, six, six treatments in ours. Well, sorry, so we sowed an experiment this year. Um, I think it's got eight treatments, I think, this year. But we actually did a bit of a pilot last year. So I thought, um, so the information that's available in your handout is actually on our pilot study. So I thought I would just go through some of that very briefly today, just to, uh, yeah, just as a first cut on, on what's been happening in this space. So last, last year, great season, similar to this, not as wet as this, but pretty good. We actually got seven, seven assessments from it. Now, um, it would be nice to be able to graze the experiment, but we weren't in a position to be able to do that. So we're actually um, mowing with a tractor and, and, a, um, and a forage harvester, removing the, 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 um, the herbage. But we, um, we actually got to cut it seven times. So um, spread out, and that was you know, every four weeks, sometimes five, depending on rainfall. So we were actually collecting data over a 180 day period which is, you know, if you, were, if you were grazing that with livestock, you know, you're looking at close to, you know, 180, well, around close to your 200 day, which, you know, which, which is really nice and something to be able to push some of these, um, these improved forages out to. Now, one of the, one of the things that became pretty, pretty clear very quickly in the, um, when we started looking at these data was actually the, the distribution of that herbage, of those species, the way they're producing over the growing season. So we had oats as our, as our benchmark, and then we had an oats plus rye. Then we actually added a brassica to that. So we had a three-way mix of oats, rye, and brassica. We had oats, rye, and a legume. And then we had the four species together. And then we also got one of the, the commercial multi-species mix, which I think had, I think had, had eight, nine, 10, sorry, 10. 10 different um, species in it to be able to evaluate that as well. And when you actually, if you get the opportunity to have a look, I'm not suggesting you do it now, but you can actually see how the different species make a contribution at different times during the growing season. So where oats um, peaked um, in spring, in, in around September, the oats rye did similar. But anything else with, a, with more mixes, with more species in it, actually extended that growing season longer. So we actually had a more even production over a longer period. Um, there is competition between the species. Um, oats was highly productive when it was on its own and would continue growing throughout the growing season. But when it was in a mix, especially with ryegrass, we actually had good production from the oats initially and then the ryegrass took over and dominated. Where, you, where we had a brassica in the system, so our, in our case we had leafy turnip, it was actually really productive early in the, in the growing season, so with, along with the oats, um, but it petered out pretty quickly. While we had uh, Persian clover, it actually didn't do much at all until quite late in the season, but then it carried through, through that 180 to the 200 day mark. So it was really quite interesting watching, um, having a look at the way those species actually provide, provided herbage throughout the growing season. Now it's, it's obviously not just about how much feed, it's about the quality of it. So at every assessment we also had a look at, we took samples and we had it analysed for, for quality. Now um, NDF or neutral detergent fibre was, um, it was excellent. So it was less than 40% throughout most of the growing season, so May to October, for all of the, tr all of the, tr all of the crops, whether it was a single or a multi-species. It was only in November, December, so very late, so that October, November, December period, um, right at the end of the growing season, that we actually started getting some, some differences. And it was in those cases um, was where we actually had the legume. So where the legume was in the system, it is part of the mix, it actually maintained or it, the, the NDF tended to be a bit lower. 
Um, the mixes that had the brassica in it, they tended to be at the top of the pot or they had the best um, the, or the lowest NDF, um, which was great. So they were less than 35% through, um, through that early part of the season. When it actually comes to ME, we actually had over 12.5 uh, ME for, um, for most of the season, so from May through to August. And then it started to, to drop off. But again, it dropped off most where we, where we did not have a legume in the system. Um, so um, in that case, it was Persian. Persian um, really came through strong by the end. So our treatments that had Persian clover actually made um, pretty good quality. Like it all dropped off, but, um, but it maintained better quality, better ME um, than the other mixes. Um, crude protein, probably not surprisingly, crude protein was pretty high. So what we did in this um, experiment, so we sowed it with a basil fertiliser and then we top dressed anything that did not have a legume in it um, after every second assessment. So after the second and the fourth assessment, we top dressed it with um, uh, 46 units of nitrogen just to keep that productivity. And it was actually interesting, by, um, by the fourth assessment, we could actually, we started getting a seesaw in production, similar to what, um, what Sean and Graham were talking about. We were actually getting that response to the nitrogen, so quality was going up, protein was going up, um, production was going up, and then it would drop off again. Even, even within that, you know, that eight week cycle, we went high and then we dropped back down again. But protein was high. Um, it was over 30% um, in May and then basically just declined throughout the growing season. The legume treatments, again, they maintained the highest crude protein, which is not surprising. Um, they, by the end of the season, they were about 15 to 17%, while um, everything else declined to around 10% by, um, by October, November. Now, these numbers are great, but it's nice to be able to have a look and see what sort of animal production we're going we could potentially get from these. So um, there is a grazing component within this experiment, um, within the project, um, but just using the data that we had, it went where um, it was put into grass feed. So we were able to estimate daily intake, dry matter intake, and also livestock production. So our dry matter intake, um, they're, all, they're all much of a muchness throughout the early part of the growing season. So 11.4 kilos per day was what was estimated by grass feed from May through to July. From August, we started to get this fluctuation with oats, and I think that was largely part initially due to the nitrogen we were applying. And then, um, and then as it went reproductive, you know, the quality fell out of it and intake declined. Well, our mixtures, they were more consistent. Now, um, in, the, in the sheet, I've only, only shown one mixture. That is the oats, rye, brassica, and uh, Persian clover mix and the mix maintained that quality or that intake um, maintained or it actually it improved it actually increased up to 12.6 uh, kilos per day by the end of the growing season that's because the um, the mix was dominated by by the legume now live weight gain was similar so again at the start of the season they're all doing 1.7 kilo per day live weight gain not bad from about August is when the tipping point was. So on the oats, it started to decline and finished up the season at about 1.2. But where we had that full species mix, it actually, it actually went up and we were looking at it, the um, grass feed estimated at 2.4 kilos as a live weight gain on that mix. So that's all, um, yeah, so no, that's not the whole story, I suppose. It's great to get that live weight gain, but we also need to take into account the economics. Um, I don't have the seed weights or, I'm sorry, the seed prices or anything like that to be able to carry through that, but that will be our next step. But I guess if you're going to put the extra investment into having one of these, these, um, these high performance type pastures or fodder crops, it's really important that you're actually utilising them. So putting your best livestock on them, your most responsive livestock, maximising your live weight gain um, for as long as possible to get that better return on your investment. Because um, you, know, you will have to be buying, buying at least some of the seeds, so you want to be getting a return on your investment. But, um, but the, data, the, the numbers so far indicate that you've, 
if you're utilising it, there's certainly um, you know, value in doing so. So this year, the, the trial or the, the project actually started off in earnest. Um, so we've got a range, we, we've, we replicated some of the same, um, same treatments, but uh, this time we added nitrogen to everything. So the, um, yeah, we added, whether it had a legume or not, we added nitrogen because um, we figured we'd go for maximum production. We added a triticale as a dual purpose crop example to see how it went. And um, I wasn't very happy with the performance of the, the multi species. I thought, I thought its productivity could have been higher. So I've kept it in the mix and I've actually included the sowing rate of it. Um, I think um, we went from, I think we sowed at 25 last year and we sowed it at 35 this year, just so we give it a better, better have another look at it. And it's, it's looking much nicer this year. So where to from here? Um, the, the project is actually really about um, winter forage crops, but hey, we're in the summer, summer rainfall zone. We'd be silly not to be looking at some summer crops as well. So um, there's, I mentioned there was a site at Glen Innes um, in addition to here. So the Glen, team Glen Innes and our team Tamworth are actually going to be doing some summer forage um, experiments as well. Um, and we'll be putting those in um, soon, very soon, if the weather sort of smiles on us. The, uh, and we've got another round of uh, winter, winter um, evaluations to go in next year. Now, in addition to that, we've also got some grazing experiments which we'll be starting. Um, they're not, the grazing experiments are not being done here. There's, an, there's one in Glen Innes and another one down at, um, at Wagga. Um, and that might be of interest to some of you, we're actually going to be doing some paired paddock um, type on farm type things. So um, like evaluation. So we actually get to see what these are like under commercial situation um, with on, yeah, on, on farm. So if anyone is interested in being involved in that or maybe hosting one of these paired paddock uh, type uh, demonstrations, um, we would love to hear from you. There is a question in the questionnaire. Um, so please just yeah, write your details on that. And I think I might leave it there.